David, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much for moderating the panel. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here, and thanks to Boston University and to uh, ICI. Uh, we, we have a uh, gigantic topic. I'm stalling a little bit to see Paul Tucker can come forward when he's ready. I see him <laughs> there. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask Dan to give uh, a brief opening remarks, and then we'll turn to Paul. And then we're going to uh, kind of flesh out a gigantic topic. So I'm hopeful during this uh, time that we have <laughs> that we're going to uh, talk about whether capital markets, d Paul, can I put you right oh, yeah, in sure. the middle? Yeah, if sure. I'll, I'll make space for you. Okay. Uh, I, if you're ready, I might have you go first, Paul, if I may. Uh, will that be all right? So I, I think the commissioner has the right to choose. Uh -huh. well, you know, it's always, there's always peril in letting the man with the British accent go first. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so as you already have seen, we have two giant speakers. Paul Tucker is the senior uh, fellow at, at Harvard's both Kennedy School and the Harvard Business School, and formerly the de deputy governor of the Bank of England. And Dan Gallagher is the sitting uh, commissioner of the SEC. And both are, uh, I did, Paul's bio is in, both of the bios are in the uh, handout. And Paul has been in the thick of uh, many of the European and BIS uh, discussions on these <coughs> regulatory issues, and Dan has for, for years and years. So we have the best possible panel, and the topics range all the way from whether capital markets form a systemic risk at all to whether the current laws allow various activities in, in, in terms of regulation, and then how should regulation be done to make things safer without being all that costly. So if we can balance all that and get it done, it'll be an achievement. Dan, who goes first? Paul. Okay. Paul goes first with the British. We'll all be second after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to be sitting alongside you two guys, and I haven't seen you for a long time, David. And thank you, Con, for inviting me to be here. This, this is a, um, a big issue. I thought the guy from Occupy did us a service in reminding us just what the costs of this crisis have been, and that we don't even now know what the crisis, the costs were, because we still haven't reached anything like normality in, in the economy. Um, closest to it probably here, perhaps second closest to it in my own country, and then continental Europe lagging behind. But until we've got that, put that together, that's easily the largest part of the world economy. Until we've got that back up to something like normal, we can't even begin to calculate just how great the systemic costs um, were. And I say that because I know that many of you in the asset management industry are intensely irritated um, by the prospect of being somehow caught within my old, my old world. And, and I'd, I'd ask you to reflect about two things, because you will be the answer to, to this. First of all, um, it would be absolutely appalling if you turned out to be wrong. I mean, don't, don't doubt that everybody wants you to be right in your gut instinct that you are not systemic. But if you go to bed at night or get up in the morning, and in fact you think maybe you've won the argument, but perhaps you shouldn't, all I would say to you is you do not want to be at the helm of a firm of either asset managers or on the tr a trustee of a fund that turns out to be systemic, um, having persuaded everybody that you weren't. The, the, the political temperature in the Western world um, remains pretty hostile to, to finance. And for what it's worth, and this is going to sound extravagant, I think it's going to remain at that kind of temperature for a, another decade, probably two. I mean, these, th these things have a... Um, have a long, have a long life. The, the, the second thing um, I would say is when we all refer to how the banks were bailed out, it's slightly misleading because, of course, actually the people who were bailed out were the bank bondholders. And many f um, funds um, own bank bonds. And 
I, I would be absolutely staggered if in the remainder of my biological lifetime bank bondholders were ever bailed out by the taxpayer um, again. I, I don't believe that is remotely um, politically feasible on either side of the um, Atlantic. Um, and it's quite possibly against the law um, here, which, you know, laws can be changed, but you can't hide from the political costs of changing laws because you let the country um, know. And the third point, and it's the one I normally start with, is, is finance is a shapeshifter. Regulatory arbitrage is absolutely um, endemic. And therefore, as banking, de jure banks are re-regulated, we all know, I mean, we know that a great deal of activity is going to move outside of the banking sector and into other parts of, of finance. And that, those parts of finance may be unlevered, they may be, uh, have no liquidity mismatch whatsoever, which would be quite a good thing. Um, but we can't be confident um, of that because the search for yield is endemic and it's absolutely, this isn't something to do with Wall Street, it's endemic in the asset management industry. Just think of those state pension funds, probably including in this state, I'm not sure, that have nominal return targets of 7% or um, 8%. I mean, this, this is, if you live in Europe, you regard this as one of the greatest distorting influences on um, financial dynamics on the planet. Um, and that is absolutely at the heart of US um, asset management. Now, I may or may not be right about that. Were I to be right, if activity is going to shift out of banks, then it is also, by and large, here and in Europe, going to shift from under the jurisdiction of central banks um, and bank supervisors to being under the jurisdiction of securities regulators or derivatives regulators or insurance regulators or under no jurisdiction um, whatsoever. Now, in terms of the concerns that are expressed about this, let me say, and I think I'm right about my own assertions in the past on this, I, I don't think I have ever said that this then entails that the style of supervision adopted by securities regulators should be some carbon copy of what the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England does. It needs to be tailored to the particular circumstances. But it does, it is a world in which um, Dan and his colleagues and his successors and Martin Wheatley in London and Stephen Mayor in Europe need to get out of bed in the morning um, and go to bed at night thinking not only about wickedness, and it would be a terrible thing if they stopped thinking about wickedness, but also thought about stability, and that they develop the know-how and the culture within market regulators to take this um, as part of their very existential existence, their vocational drive, what it is that took them into and leaves them in public service, whether it be for the American people or what we call the public. Um, and that's not easy um, anywhere. My points are not just about the SEC and the United States. I think if one scans um, the last 25, 35 years, <clears throat> a lot of which I can remember, there are not many occasions when the chair of the SEC or the chair of the UK securities regulators um, have testified to Congress or Parliament and been asked about financial stability. Um, and actually, legislators can completely change the game. They can completely change um, the incentives of public officials through the questions that they ask, the letters that they write, the investigations that they um, put in train. I mean, there are elected representatives. They set the rules of the game. Now, there is one te technical question, which is, does the SEC have the mandate for this at all? A, a curiosity about of, of lots of US agency legislation, the SEC's legislation is not the worst in this respect, um, is that often it doesn't state an objective um, at all. I, 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 think that's, I, I, th I think that's a kind of deep flaw in terms of democracy, um, because I think it hands high policy to unelected officials, but it, it's as it is. Section 2 of the 34 Act, which is worth reading for those of you that haven't, or those of you that haven't read it in a long time, is absolutely fascinating, because it reads more like a preamble to the legislation I'm more familiar with, which is that it sets out all the circumstances that 
bore on the creation of the SEC. And in a couple of places it says, because if we don't have kind of well-managed and well-regulated securities markets, um, then we can get credit boom and, and bust. Not the exact words used, but absolutely the concept that is um, in there. So I, I would like to see, uh, I guess, the SEC republish its mission over the next few years and include financial stability in its um, own sense of its mission. I think that can be squared um, with the 34 Act. If it can't be squared with the 34 Act, I think SEC leaders, and not only SEC leaders, their counterparts elsewhere in the world, should go to the legislature and say, you know, we don't seem to have a mandate for this, and you've got to decide whether we're in this game or not. You're the, um, the legislators. And then, having got over that hump, I would like um, legislators to start asking questions and pressing market regulators about all the subjects that are being discussed today. And if some of that happens, we will have a fighting chance of having a stable financial system. And if it doesn't, we won't. Okay, fabulous. That's a great layout. Dan? Well. Mr. Commissioner. Yeah, that's right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to Khan uh, for inviting me. It's a real honor uh, to be here. Uh, Paul is free to not give his Bank of England disclaimer anymore. Of course, I have to give the I SEC. Did, I, didn't, I didn't give it when I was, actually. Fair enough. Yeah, I, 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 right. I was speaking for the Bank of England. <laughs> <laughs> We don't, re we don't really understand all this disclaimer stuff. <laughs> it's very cheeky Sorry. of you, yes. Uh, so, um, so I have to give uh, the disclaimer that my, my views are my own and don't necessarily reflect the views of the commission or other commissioners. And for most of you guys are pretty savvy. You know that that's uh, truly the case, especially if you've seen my voting record at the SEC over the last two years. So uh, a tragedy for the capital markets, but uh, good for the others in the majority. So. Uh, Look, I think it's great that this conference is happening. I think it's great that the discussion is happening. It won't shock Paul, who I've known for a long time. We got to know each other when Paul was the chairman of the FSF Crisis Management Working Group, and I was the uh, SEC rep sitting at the kids' table uh, somewhere in the back. Uh, <laughs> okay, I can finally gripe about that in public, Paul. Uh, uh, but anyway, I think uh, Paul has been a, a real thought leader on a lot of these issues, whether I agree or disagree. It's good to have someone thoughtful out there provoking this uh, type of conversation. So we're talking more about the, the macro issue of uh, regulatory structure, the, the paradigm itself, not necessarily the asset manager uh, designation debate, although I can't resist uh, pointing out my own view uh, at the outset that I view the debate about asset managers and systemic risk um, as a contrivance. I think that uh, as a policymaker, it's important to take a step back and look at first principles. And if you look at first principles with respect to the financial crisis, you have to ask yourself, what were the actual causes of the financial crisis? And here in the US, that has purportedly happened. Uh, you know, we've had a financial crisis inquiry commission that was uh, set up by a huge majority uh, in the Senate that issued its report, Peter, seven months after the Dodd-Frank Act uh, was put into place, the Dodd-Frank Act being, of course, the congressional response to the financial crisis. Uh, and I think the PSI, the, the Senate PSI report came out uh, shortly thereafter. So the, the narratives about the causes of financial crisis post-date the legislation uh, addressing it. And so you say to yourself, well, then what did they base Dodd-Frank on? What narratives, what findings, uh, you know, what did they think the causes of the financial crisis were in 2,319 pages? And I think for purposes of today's conference, the asset management piece, it's the notion that Wall Street greed and regulatory failures, both of which we're going to touch on here, caused the financial crisis. And I'm just not one to subscribe to that easy narrative. It, the talking points are much easier, so it's in my interest to su subscribe to it. Uh, you get away with murder if you do. Uh, but to, to really uh, want to make policy based on solid footing, I think you have to take a deep look, which I'll embarrass Peter Wallace, but he's done in his recent book about the actual causes of the financial crisis. And I think un undisputably here in the United States, you cannot ignore the role of failed federal housing policy in the cause of the financial crisis. So any debate like you've had in your first couple panels about asset management to me is almost a diversion and a contrivance away from uh, the real issue. And of course, I've said this publicly, no surprise in 
2,319 pages of Dodd-Frank that you can find only fleeting reference to Fannie and Freddie, uh, because of course those who wrote the statute were complicit in the underlying causes of the financial crisis, so they weren't you know, too amenable to writing about their own failings. So um, this debate about the financial industry, its role I think is a good one. There were excesses in the uh, financial industry. There was greed. There always is when there's a bubble, uh, a credit bubble fueled by some other macro policy here, it being not only monetary policy, but failed federal housing policy. And this is one of those issues where, again, it's easier to submit to the prevailing narrative because it's easier to write rules if you actually believe uh, that that's the narrative, that we need to rein in uh, Wall Street greed, that we need to correct our own regulatory failures. I think regulatory failures happened too. I can cite you several at the SEC. I lived through the crisis uh, in the division of trading and markets, but were they the cause or were they really just a symptom of the larger illness, which was federal housing policy? Those are questions I think we need to continue to ask uh, as policymakers. I don't think we can regulate to the false narratives, and it's great and fine to disagree, but to dismiss one view, I think, is to dismiss the actual causes of the crisis, is to then regulate to those wrong causes, and in the context of asset management in particular, is to put in peril uh, a hugely important industry here in the United States and, and globally is to put at peril investors who are going to pay the costs of any increased regulation. And I think we need to take that uh, into account at the SEC. I think we need to take it into account more generally uh, globally. I think uh, shifting over uh, to, to Paul's comments, and I, it's one uh, comment about the mission of the SEC. I think it's a, it's a great point he makes, and I think it's a, a brave one. People dance around the issue, what are the various roles and, and mandates uh, of the regulators. I, th I personally believe uh, the SEC mandate, uh, the mission in the statute to protect investors, facilitate fair and efficient markets, and to uh, facilitate capital formation, uh, if done correctly, uh, if done with uh, vigor and with proper data and policy making, uh, undoubtedly will uh, mitigate systemic risk. I think the, the notion that we need a systemic risk mandate uh, is, to me, not correct in the sense that, you know, if we come in every day, if we do our job, and we do it better, and I do think there are many lessons learned uh, from the crisis where we can do our job better, uh, then we are doing our part vis-a-vis -vis systemic risk. And I don't think it's a debate that's without peril, because if you're me and you're trapped in the day-to-day -day trench fight that is the SEC, you know what would happen if you came in and had to regulate with a systemic risk mandate behind you. Just think about it, right? Paul already uh, mentioned the comments earlier about the costs of the crisis. We get comment letters in, so let's quantify the crisis at $18 trillion, $20 trillion. Using that as a baseline, no regulation is too costly. You, you can justify, Craig even, uh, you know, as stingy as Craig is, Craig could justify any rule uh, with an $18 trillion baseline. And I think that it sounds like a discreet point, but I have to tell you it's real. We experienced it in some of the earlier Title VII rulemakings uh, with the staff citing to us, the commissioners, uh, you know, comments saying, don't worry about the cost of this rule, $17 trillion uh, loss avoided is the benefit. I don't know how you make good policy in that regard. And do know despite many of the misgivings with, uh, and, and failures uh, in either the statutory mission or the operations of capital markets regulators, here in the U.S., we're the only ones that are conducting cost-benefit analyses, right? The SEC, I think, doing better than others, still not perfect, but boy, tremendously better. Uh, I issued, I don't know if you saw the chart uh, I issued last week about the uh, regulations applicable to a hypothetical U.S. financial services holding company since 2010. And I really tried to be modest and netted them down to 200. Go look at the chart. It's up uh, on the website. No one's looking at that in the aggregate, not even the SEC. We're looking at each disparate rule with respect to cost benefit. But if you take the SEC off the playing field, the CFTC, if you change the baseline uh, to systemic risk, what then do you do from a policymaking standpoint? What, what regulations could you not impose? Uh, one last point before I, I turn it back over uh, uh, to David is, and, and Paul knows I, I believe this deeply, the notion that bank-like 
regulation makes sense in the capital markets to me is an anathema. I, do, I don't understand the notion of de-risking, inherently risk-taking markets, uh, treating like banks, institutions that should be risk-taking institutions that investors come to uh, for investment return, uh, that should, by the way, be able to fail if they take excessive risk. There should be no confusion as to whether there's government support or taxpayer dollars on the line. Yeah. Graying that area, I think, is inherently dangerous. So I, I don't say we shouldn't have the debate. I totally agree with Paul about this. But, but as I've said in several speeches, uh, and, and one uh, in particular about the philosophies of capital regimes, if you look at the philosophy of bank capital, right, going concern capital, uh, systemic safety, bank safety capital, going concern capital. It's inherently different than what we administer for brokers at the SEC. It's wind down capital, right? So there's a philosophical divide. And I think there's a notion, if you read certain Fed governor speeches, uh, uh, Dudley and I talk about this a lot, Eric Rosengren and I talk about it. If you subscribe to the notion that it's somehow possible to bridge the divide between going concern and wind down capital, you're, you're crazy. I'd like to see that creative writing exercise. They're two vastly different things philosophically. And so the notion that in a bank world, bank regulatory world, more capital is better, more capital is always better. But what we can't forget is that there is an optimal level of capital. And every dollar above that is a dollar not working in the economy. And if it's driven by this notion that we can't let people fail, then I think, too, policymakers are speaking out of both sides of their mouths. Right? If, you, if you look at the speeches, we're going to let everybody fail. But you need more capital. Well, then why, right? If it's sufficient to wind you down when you do fail, what's that incremental amount of capital going to do? And so I do think these philosophical issues have not been addressed. I think uh, they weren't addressed in Dodd-Frank, despite apparently there wasn't room in 2,319 pages to either address these philosophical divides. Uh, they couldn't add a clause uh, in the mission provision of the 34 Act adding systemic risk, but, but they could add conflict mineral disclosure. And by the way, that was the actual cause of the financial crisis. We've taken care of that. Uh, Paul, Paul knows. And he and I were in the trenches when Tantalum took down Lehman. And it, it'll never happen again. So, um, and, 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 and that's going to be a nod, one last remark, a nod to Paul uh, with respect to capital markets regulation, the SEC particularly, and the distraction of the mandate of capital markets regulators. Uh, you know, these core financial system safety and soundness issues, they are important uh, to the SEC and capital markets regulators. Part of the problem we've had at the commission over the last five years, why we've not been relevant in this debate, in my estimation, is because we've been distracted with what I like to call the shiny objects of, of Dodd-Frank, the conflict minerals, the extractive resources, pay ratio, uh, things that were completely extraneous to the financial crisis, things that were intensely political, divisive at the commission level, and while we dealt with those the last four and a half years, uh, Paul, when he was at the Bank of England, the Fed officials, uh, whether at the New York, Boston, or on the board, OCC, FDIC, were, were dealing with real issues related to the crisis. And so for that reason, and not, not that I fault the commission, although I think the agenda could have been set radically differently over the last uh, four and a half years, uh, I do think they deserve to be mildly annoyed at the fact that we haven't been an active participant in these debates, and I think it's time we had it. I want to encourage interaction. So, Paul, did you have yeah. uh, points on that? Um, <clears throat> I, I agree. Well, as you know, I agree with a great deal of what you've said. And, I mean, I'm in no position to speak for my former colleagues in the central banking world, but I, I would be absolutely staggered if they didn't welcome your last statement. They, they my sense would be that they dearly, dearly want an SEC and ESMA in Europe um, to be actively involved in these debates. I don't think there is any um, pervasive desire among central bankers to completely dominate these, agree. these agree. debates, Frank, because frankly it's too dangerous. I, I thought you absolutely got it right um, in terms of, it's all about can we cope with failure. It, um, it is really, really all about that. And had I been chairing the international exercise on what's it called non-bank, non-insurance things, 
and B, um, N, I, G, CIFI. Yeah, I, I would have started. by penicillin. If, I, would have started with, I would have started with the question, well, let's take some um, hypothetical and some real examples and think through whether we'd be able to cope under the law given the nature of those businesses. And in those circumstances, it really does help that there are lots of knowledgeable officials in the world because when that debate started with the banks, the banks would say, oh, well, we're not connected to that. And they'd say, oh, I'd slightly, oh you no longer do this. And they'd go, oh, gracious, they know we do that. Um, so that's the right way into the debate. And I, I think you make a good point in, that in saying it costs $17 trillion. I absolutely do not think it follows from that, that therefore everything should be regulated. On the, on the contrary, I share many of your instincts about the, the social costs of regulation. But the way to pin that down is precisely, as you say, could we cope with, with failure? And that's the question that kind of the bosses of almost every asset manager or fund or whatever um, should ask themselves. And uh, who knows what they would conclude, and they wouldn't necessarily all conclude the, the, the same thing. And that hasn't really entered into the debate very much, particularly, I would say, on this side of the Atlantic. Yeah. David, if, if I just, I don't want to lose this thread, because I, I don't know if everyone saw um, Hal Scott's op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last week. It was on Lender of Last Resort. Yeah. I don't know if you saw it. Um, and I think he, he was brave in, in writing it. I do think uh, he hits the core issue. I, I really do think all uh, of this policy debate revolves around failure. Failure uh, revolved in large part about lender of last resort and whether it's going to be there and not and under what circumstances. And here in the states, uh, since Dodd-Frank, there's been absolute confusion as to whether the Fed will or will not be a lender of last resort. What was the impact of Dodd-Frank upon 13.3? Uh, did it really limit the Fed? Will the Fed uh, bail out a class of institutions going forward? and this is where I might be contrarian, uh, you know, based on what I saw in 2008 and how decisions were made, hell yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, if I read uh, Governor Torillo's speeches versus uh, Dudley's speeches, I think Dudley would agree with me and Torillo would say we wouldn't do it. All of this just means to me that there's confusion. If there's confusion about lender of last resort, we can't set a rational regulatory policy because we won't understand failure. And uh, I think that this is something we have to get at, and I'll tell you what the core issue is, is that lender of last resort has been unduly conflated with bailouts. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And it's just not the same, and this is where I completely agree Absolutely. with Hal, and unless we can get clarity on that point, I don't see how you get to rational regulatory regimes. I don't see how you get ever have enough capital, right? Goldman Sachs could have had 110% capital in 2008. Right? There still was going to be a run, right? Without access uh, to the government, without access to uh, you know the Fed facilities, or the bank holding company uh, status that they got, the notion that there was stability because that brought with it the Fed facilities, capital is not going to get you there. Uh, and so the alternative is failure. And if we've all decided we're not going to allow failure, well then we better start thinking more and more about lender of last resort. Unfortunately, we're caught in the middle. As you might guess, I tend to fall on the side of of failure. Why haven't we spent any time here in the States looking by way of autopsy at Lehman? What happened with Lehman? I, I'm going to go out on a limb and tell you I don't think it was as bad as people think. Bankruptcy code worked, right? It was ugly in some ways. It didn't there work very well problems. in London. It didn't work in London. Yeah. That was your own bankruptcy regime in, in London, I'll point out. We, we were, we, that we, caused we, the U.S. bankruptcy. We, we, we had thought the SEC was doing consolidated supervision <laughs> of the Lehman. <laughs> And, and I thought the moral hazard was such that there would be a central bank bailout. But anyway, uh, you know, I think that uh, in, until and unless, and I, I don't think Paul's going to disagree with me, that until and unless we get clarity on, on lender of last resort, until and unless we can agree that it's actually not a bailout. Yeah, this is massive. Can I interrupt? Yes. yes. I, th I think the more that non-central bank regulatory officials say that, the better, frankly, because, um, and then I think the central bank contribution has got to be, and I've been on the record on this over the past year, they have got to persuade the world that they will not lend to irretrievably insolvent institutions. That, if those institutions get bailed out, that's a taxpayer thing. And believe me, you do not want to be one of, you do not want to be one of them. That's right. um, this is a, you know, you are treated as a pariah in society. And public officials, 
I think, have almost zero incentive to go to the president or the prime minister and say, well, actually, we don't think our bag of tricks would work. Give us um, half a trillion dollars to bail out an irretrievably insolvent firm. But what's happened, what Hal Scott's concern is, is that this kind of lender of last resort, liquidity crisis, solvency crisis, has become so mixed up in people's minds that I don't know whether this is true, but some good people sincerely believe that the Federal Reserve is now less equipped to deal with an authentically liquidity crisis. Now, if that's true, um, America is in a weaker place than it was. That would, I fear, make a case for higher capital um, requirements, and that should worry the rest of the world greatly. And the way through that is exactly your way through it, which is rebuild um, the conceptual distinction between liquidity crisis and solvency crisis, and then the Fed and the Bank of England, the ECB and others, to, to demonstrate to the world how they would satisfy themselves of that distinction in real time, which I do believe can be done. And I think these are things that people knew how to do in 1866, right. which is a very important right. year. So I'm taking back control of this panel. <laughs> that, that was great. I, I have two narratives that I want to run by Paul, and he can shoot them down. And if they're dumb narratives, he can. It's somebody else that gave me the narratives. One, I, 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 it wasn't I me. Don't, I don't want to lose our talk of 2008 and Lehman. Yeah. And so, w I wonder your reaction. The U.S. thought that the Bank of England was going to approve or the appropriate officials in England were going to approve a Barclays takeover of some of the assets of Lehman Brothers, and then it didn't happen. Uh, any, any recollections on what went wrong there? The U.S. blames I, England a little bit for I, this crisis. I, 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 I have no recollections, but I, I, <laughs> I, I, will, I will say something, which is that, that and, and I'm going to put it um, slightly brutally, and I've, I've said it like this in sessions with um, the most senior officials in the states at the time, which is, so you're asked to approve that your bank buys this other firm, which may or may not be bust, but it's absolutely apparent that none of the people that regulate it know anything about it. So would your, would your firm please rescue um, this firm? And so you ask yourself the question, I wonder if we're going to have to bail out both in a fortnight. Oh, that would be pretty difficult. Um, so we don't want to do that. And um, I thought it was very strange the question was ever um, asked, um, given the kind of, in some ways, an important qualification, um, understandable chaos in Washington and New York over that weekend. But. Um, just extracting contingent capital from foreign governments didn't seem to be the um, best way forward um, at that point. The, the, the U.S. has more taxpayers than the U.K. <laughs> <laughs> Th thank you. Now, a more modern uh, narrative. So just last <laughs> week, um, it, the, the FSB... Uh, issued, dropped this paper, uh, yeah. and it talks about specific asset managers, and by coincidence, none of the asset managers that would be designated uh, NBNI GSIFIs, <laughs> which are non-bank, non-insurance, global, syst systemically important financial institutions, uh, would be uh, European. They would all, by by chance happened to be American, meaning a, a uh, aggressive regulatory overlay from the FSB onto a, an industry which the U.S. has a big strategic advantage in. And isn't this a little bit of a, uh, a, an angle where European regulation can come into the U.S.? Um, no. Um, I, I didn't know any particular firms were named in that document, but I haven't read it to the end, As to I be understand fair. how they laid out the criteria, yeah. uh, it was based on size, meaning asset <coughs> managers of a certain size, which ended up then guiding them. I don't know if there's others in the room. I don't know. I, look, look, um, London's got an absolutely massive <coughs> asset management industry, so London isn't going to have um, an anti-US agenda around this. The chairman of the FSB 
Um, Mark is a Canadian, worked on Wall Street. He absolutely doesn't have any kind of anti-US um, agenda. I think what there is, is a very clear um, sense, and this is worth saying, I think, because this is true, of how the system across the world is so joined up that no one can do it on their own. The United States cannot make its financial system safe without erecting capital controls, which I don't think it's going to do. I mean, you, you cannot, even, even the United States cannot um, do that. Everything is so joined up. And if any of you are thinking that can't be right, you think about what set off the liquidity crisis in the August 2007. A, a fund managed by BMP in Paris suspended redemptions. Later that day, the Federal Reserve operated three times in the money markets to try and pull the overnight rate down in line um, with its target Fed funds rate within hours. Um, later that evening, the Bank of Japan um, operated as well. I think the Australians did too. Just one little um, episode. We are so joined up, but we have been for so long. You think about Herstadt's failure in 1974. Some of you are old enough to remember it. Um, German bank with activities mainly in Europe, but um, in fact mainly just in Germany but conducting dollar Deutschmark transactions. It had received the Deutschmark, the Deutschmarks and foreign exchange transactions. It went, it closed before it had delivered on the dollar leg. Chaos here. And of course, the biggest case over the last century, Credit Anstalt fails in 1930, something or other, and the US is tipped into the next phase of the terrible 1920s and 30s session. You, you cannot, nobody, London, the US cannot make policy um, on your own without capital controls, which no one wants to do. And, but the, current, the currents are so complicated that I, I didn't see anybody come to that table when I was at the top table for many years, I guess, um, with a national partisan position. And there are other people in the room that were at that table where the partisan position wasn't exposed. And frankly, I would sometimes do it myself. And something that friends know, but I, did, I typically went into those debates not briefed on the position of the UK system um, in response to the things we were discussing, because my true belief was that the UK could only be safe if the whole of the world was, was safe. And therefore, I would blind myself to true interests of the British public if I started over-briefing myself on Barclays and RBS and um, firms that happen to be domiciled in the UK. And I think that's true um, here too. So to both of you, and then I'm going to go to audience questions, um, should asset managers be named CIFIs uh, within either the US process or the GCIFI process? Dan and then Paul. No. Uh, for both. Should activities, should asset management activities? Look, again, you know, this goes to my initial comment, which is I think the whole debate is a contrivance mm -hmm. about the financial crisis, right? It's a, a reaching out in many instances. If you look at the FSB by, you know, central bankers, it's the same at FSOC for more control of markets they didn't heretofore control. It's natural in any bureaucracy, in any governmental setting to want more power. And Paul will disagree with me on that. That's, but, you know, so what then is the benefit? Uh, you know, what is, and, if, and well, Paul and I just agreed. It's clear about, in Washington yeah. the benefit is that if you're designated as if you fall under Federal Reserve regulation. So there's a giant benefit in Washington to doing that. And I think if it was, then we'd have much more willing participants sitting in the audience uh, today for that process. I, I, I don't believe it. I don't think anyone wants to be viewed as beholden uh, to the government subject uh, to bailout. I don't believe that most market participants want that competitive advantage. I think they want to compete in the markets and, and succeed or fail um, as uh, per their efforts. And I think that's what the American dream and economy are all about, and that's the way we should leave it. The notion 
that the Fed can regulate asset managers or should want to, I think, is crazy. And I don't think they do, to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, the, the notion, I think Paul and I just agreed, that most of these debates are driven by the fear of failure. And I have yet to be seen. I, put, I wrote my own comment letter to, to the OFR yes. last year, assuming uh, <laughs> first commissioner ever to write a comment letter to his own comment file. I've done lots of things for the first no, time. No, it was, it was admirable. But if it's driven by the notion of, of, of failure, well, then let's look back to the financial crisis. Didn't see a lot of failure in the asset management industry. Paul will say it's because the banks were bailed out. We can have that debate. Uh, let's look back to the strong, I think it was the strong failure 10 years ago. Let's see that this is actually pretty easy. In an agency business, failure is easy. And I think the pending SEC rules that Mary Jo White has talked about uh, that I think are going to be, if done properly, a, a positive uh, for both the industry and the SEC. One thing I will tell you, and this goes to the point I made last in my introductory remarks, the SEC needs to become a savvier regulator. We need more data and we need to be able to handle it and be facile with it in ways that we were not during the crisis. Because there is a perception in the asset management side, for sure, on the investment bank side, but that's largely moot uh, because they're all within bank holding companies now, that we just were not a capable regulator. And you know, sometimes when you get industry members coming in saying, we want you to be a capable uh, regulator, we want you to be more informed, sometimes you don't believe them. On this, I, I actually do. Everyone should want a strong and smart uh, SEC. So I think this rule set that will give us more data, that will, will uh, you know, put requirements in on liquidity, that will not exactly do um, uh, what the uh, bank regulators have done on living wills and what Dodd-Frank has done on living wills, but have a better understanding of resolution will do a lot to demystify all this. Yeah. Resolution in this space is simple, and if that's what the core issue is, then let's move on, right? Let's go look at failed federal housing policy. Paul, so, Paul, should uh, asset managers be SIFIs, and can the Federal Reserve adequately regulate those, and is that a good idea? So I don't, I don't know whether there are any individual asset managers who should be designated. I do think it's a good idea to do the work, um, because the costs, the costs of you being wrong would be very high. And that, that's, that's, it's that that warrants the, the work, and that's where the $17 trillion is um, is relevant, and you, you you may be right, and it may be easy to demonstrate you're right by talk by analysing what would happen in circumstances of of failure, and that's part of the work that should be done. My perception of the FSB and others is that the debate has moved towards activities. Um, I th oh. I think. I'm sorry, you, and do you think that was reflected in the paper last week? I think you can find it there, yeah. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> read the footnotes. Well, no, no, read the, I, the, read the, read the sentiment. Um, the, the other thing I would say in passing, I can't be sure of this, but it, I doubt whether the Federal Reserve is on a power grab. If you're the chair of the Federal Reserve, you, you don't feel short of of national and international and intergalactic stature, you know, and, and some of the things, one of the things political scientists, for the kind of BU people in the room, one of the things political scientists often get wrong is they think all bureaucrats want more power and want more budget, and that, that can be, I mean, it can be absolutely the opposite. If you, 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 in some respects, you want clear mandates and powers that can ensure that you fulfill those mandates, and getting more responsibilities and getting more powers can frankly be positively hazardous. Not, not all agency leaders are fools. Although, you know, maybe, um, <laughs> uh, which is what the political science literature effectively is, assumes. I don't know why. Um, can, I, can, I, can I change the subject in one respect, though? In that I think this debate about markets and so on yeah. and the effects of regulatory arbitrage is, is by no means just about designation. Let me give you an example. So. One of the um, massive changes that is occurring in banking is the idea that there will not be static minimum capital requirements because any, any capital requirement you calibrate for normal times will turn out to be insufficient for a desired degree of resilience um, in the exuberant phase of the business cycle. Now, I'm arguing by broad analogy. This isn't like carrying prudential supervision across. So the setting of minimum margin requirements and minimum haircut requirements in derivative markets, or in, whether cleared or not cleared, um, and in repo markets, is actually also a revolution. And I think you'll find that um, regulators around the world want those to be dynamically adjustable 
um, as well. I mean, I don't think, though, I would be surprised if there are many people in the halls I used to frequent who think that society can rely on for-profit clearing houses or um, broker dealers and their customers always ch setting minimum haircuts and um, margin requirements at the s socially tolerable level. What happens in a boom is that they shrink and shrink and shrink to zero. And if anyone needs um, to be persuaded of this, I walked in late to a meeting two years ago in Washington around the time of the annual meetings, and there was, and someone was talking about minimum margin requirements. And for the industry, asset managers, as well as sell side, said, I, we can see why you want to do this for variation margin, um, but you know, um, it, it would be a great mistake to have um, minimum margin requirements for initial um, margin. There are, there are some things where there, there really isn't very much risk, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess I was slightly more techie on this, but you won't see, it wasn't very techie than some of my colleagues. And I said, and as I sat down, I said, I'm sorry to interrupt, Chair. Could, could you just explain um, how much leverage you get with a zero um, um, initial margin requirement? And they looked as though they were running out of oxygen, and I wanted them to run out of oxygen, because the leverage is infinite. And if any, if any moment in the last two, two or three years underlines the capacity that you sometimes have to just bullshit the yeah. official sector, and you're not bullshitting the people in the official sector, you're bullshitting the American people. That's infinite leverage. With infinite leverage, things can go horribly, horribly wrong. And it's, they pay. They pay. So I think it isn't just about designating individual um, firms, and it's certainly not about closing capital markets. I regard the whole thing around the resolution of banks, of making banks part of a capitalist economy again, rather than having that as the socialist part of the US economy and the European economy. I mean, banks ought to re-enter capitalism, and you should want to stay part of capitalism, and that means satisfying yourselves that you can withstand the bad things that go on. We're going to go to questions, but Dan, any, <laughs> any response there on counter-cyclical uh, margin requirements and so on? Well, look, I think, uh, I'm not going to say I, I, I agree necessarily. I, I do think um, there's a long and, and proud history, at least in the brokerage industry, of, of house margin, what I like to call skin-in-the-game margin, which usually uh, exceeds regulatory margin, working pretty well. I mean, Paul's right, the incentives are there to incentivize activity on, on which you make fees to lower the margin. But, you know, taking away the notion of skin in the game, that firms don't uh, worry about their own demise, um, I, I, don't, I don't fully subscribe to that. And I don't subscribe to the notion that the government will get it right. And I, I would point uh, you to the Basel standards leading into the financial crisis. To, uh, you know, right? So, uh, but I, I couldn't also resist, David, uh, on the FSB in this notion, uh, you know, you have 30 or, uh, or so folks voting and uh, mostly uh, central bank dominated, mostly European uh, dominated. You know, there's this very interesting work stream going on in Europe right now, the Capital Markets Initiative, which I find fascinating because I think it's completely at odds with the FSB shadow banking work streams. So, you know, within the same continent, you have two uh, directly competing ideas. Uh, I've asked questions at, uh, at uh, HM Treasury. I've asked questions at the PRA and, and elsewhere. How do you square these? Um, still looking for the answer to that. Uh, but what I do know is that here for the U.S. economy, 80 percent of our uh, financing happens in the capital markets and 20 percent in the bank markets, and it's the opposite in Europe. And I think they're right uh, to look at the success of our markets and want to expand uh, what they have here. The true irony, though, and Paul was probably too polite to say this, is uh, the head of the shadow banking committee at the FSB is the Fed, right? So what uh, they're going off into Basel and trying to do what they cannot accomplish here domestically, see, for example, last week's paper. So uh, I just find that a mystery that we would uh, want to go into an international body and create standards that will impair uh, are incredibly vibrant and, and crucially important markets here, and then try to bootstrap it, uh, citing communiques uh, from the G20, which apparently are treaties. Um, you know, these days in Washington, you don't know what's law and what's not. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, I, th I find this to be highly problematic. This very last point, this is, this is a really big point because these aren't treaty organizations, the G20 um, leaders meetings, the summits, these aren't treaty um, right. meetings, and yet you cannot govern on your own. This is the, the greatest challenge to Western democracy is, is how to square globalization and democracy and national autonomy and the, the way, and I've published on, on, so what would be delusional is to pretend that anyone can. Um, the way through this, and David has kind of manifest this, is for each nation to engage in the international con consultations. Um, or put up capital controls, which would be to give the, the world to Asia. Or to include financial services in the TTIP negotiations. Oh, well, I'm in favor of that. I'm in favor of that. So but all, the, all, all of your agencies... No, no, um, not me. Are, not I don't, me. No, 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 yeah. but I don't mean you personally. The, the agencies lobbied the White House very hard right. to exclude. No one should have any doubt about this. The initial White House instinct was to include financial right. services right. in the treaty. Right. Things. All the agencies lobbied the White House incredibly hard to get them excluded, and most of the financial services industry did um, as well yeah. on this side of the Atlantic. You should have seen my meeting at Boffin last year, Paul, where the head of Boffin asked me what I thought about this issue. And I said, absolutely, yeah. we should include financial services. In but, but I come from the country that really does believe in free trade. <laughs> but the, the, tre the Treasury attache almost had a heart attack. <laughs> uh, Raise your hands and please identify yourself, uh, your affiliation. This gentleman here, one, and then one in the back. Do, do we have a microphone? Uh, She's bringing it forward. Thank you to both of you. I know Paul is going to yeah. Six, five, leave, six, has a hard <laughs> stop, but we've got time here. Go ahead, uh, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Larry Kotlikoff. I'm a professor of economics here at Boston University. Let me give you the economist perspective, or an economist perspective on what really is going on here. We have a public good, which is the financial highway system. And the banks and all the other players and the fina financial corporations are managing this high public good. And the reason that there's so much regulation of it is because it is a public of this industry. Yeah, that's right. It's the the apples industry does not have you know f all these different regulatory bottles, bodies uh, overseeing it. So we've got a public good, and the basic idea in economics is you don't gamble with a public good. And there's actually two pu public goods. One is the operation of the financial system, and the other is the state of confidence in the economy. So when you have major financial companies fail. You know, it wasn't the failure of Lehman that actually brought down the economy. It was the panic that ensued. The Fed and the Treasury, the President, the politicians, they, and the press all contributed to that, in my in my view. So that you know, employers just said, "Well, look, I'm going to fire my employees before uh, I start losing customers." And of course, his employees were somebody else's customers. So we need to have a financial. So the basic principle here of a public good is you don't gamble with it. So that means you need to have a financial system that can never fail. Now, a 100% equity financed mutual fund system uh, is such a system. And it needs to have, be one where there's disclosure. Because the other reason why there was uh, a run was because, and you guys have mentioned this, uh, the lack of information. Nobody knew what Bear Stearns has, Goldman has. Nobody really knew because there was no disclosure. So what we need to have is a government agency that actually discloses in real time what mortgage this guy actually has, whether he, whether he has a job, what his tax record is, uh, whether the appraised value of his home is actually, not identifying by name, but, but in real time on the computer so you can look it up easily. You don't have to be John Paulson to do the research. So that can be done. There's a proposal called Limited Purpose Banking. I wrote a book called Jimmy Stewart is Dead. Uh, it also shows, I think Paul's focused on derivatives. I think that's where you're coming from, the leverage in derivatives markets. There's a way to run derivatives down, markets down, with no through mutual funds. It goes back to 1857, the paramutual racetrack betting, where all the money's on the table, the bet's right there, and some of us bet on horse A and some bet on horse B. The money's right there. Horse A could be Greek bonds default. Horse B could be they don't, and the, there's no risk to the bet to the outside to the taxpayers. We can have an entire financial system that is risk-free and never fails, never brings down the economy. And what I see going on here, and you guys can comment now, I'm sorry I took so long here, is that, uh, is that the, non, uh, the equity finance mutual fund system is kind of being attacked because they're not being hit with the same bureaucratic rules 
But the real future of financial stability is equity financial mutual funds. Thank you. So it's, it's great to see you. Um, and I enjoyed our discussions about that when I was in office. And in, in one sense, that's not what's happening. And Dan lives in a kind of second or third or fourth best um, world. In another respect, you, you make a big point, which is no one wants to kind of dent um, equity financed, i.e. unlevered mutual funds that are marked to market. And certainly my own preference for money market mutual funds was to move to variable nav, not to move to a, um, um, a capital requirement. And, and what, what you, I think there is a sense of the value of what you're describing, because, um, and if I get too techy, you you have to cut me off, David, but the, 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 the way that the bank resolution issue is being tackled is that they must issue bonds that can be written down after um, equity, and that actually is not a hard thing for U.S. banks and dealers because of the holding company um, structure. But then the question is, is who can hold that paper? And obviously, you do not want it to be held by other banks or money market mutual funds or other kind of banking type entities. In fact, you want it to be held by um, equity finance mutual funds and perhaps some kind of pension funds, etc. So I, I think there is a very strong feeling in my old community, which would, I think, chime probably with securities regulators, that my God, um, equity is the route to this. And in, in the context of the European Capital Markets Union debate, I think the greatest desire is to have um, a much bigger cross-border equity market within Europe. I mean, in terms of this great economy, the greatest mechanism for risk sharing from California to Mississippi to Massachusetts mm -hmm. um, is actually the financial markets and equity. It's not unemployment benefit, which is a kind of last resort kind of thing. And, and Europe want to get to that. And I think that policymakers, although they're not doing what you would like best, Larry, I don't think they have lost sight of the importance of equity and equity mutual um, funds. And I've been out of office for about 15 months, but I was, no, about 18 months, I was never in a meeting where these debates about asset managers had any tone whatsoever of wanting to damage equity mutual funds um, or equity finance mutual funds um, at all. Uh, sir, in the, was there a question in the back? Yes. Hi. Thanks for the fascinating discussion. Justin Chardon with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Commissioner Gallagher, you made a reasonable point about the idea that you have to if you have to quantify financial stability benefits, then that could be misused to uh, sort of justify any sort of regulation. There's a mirror image of that in Washington right now where there's a strong push for cost-benefit analysis to any new regulations as well, which I think the positions tend to be reversed where people see that being misused because the costs are easier to, uh, to calculate for industry than the financial benefits are to quantify. Is the answer here to use one or both of these together or neither? And is there a way to ensure that the analysis that comes out of these is not, is not used ideologically but is used in context? Okay. Yeah, I think, look, cost-benefit is, is critically important in policymaking, and I think the SEC does a better job than most in large part because of Craig Lewis here. Um, I think it has to be used. It should be used in all regulation. Unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, get used by the banking regulators. Uh, see, for example, the Volcker rule, which was done completely without cost-benefit analysis. In fact, uh, they had to twist and contort and get the SEC to do a rulemaking under the Bank Holding Company Act to avoid a cost-benefit analysis. So think about that. Uh, if you're going to use both, uh, I'm somewhat agnostic on it, but uh, when, when we say both, it includes this notional amount that's attributable to the financial crisis. I think we first have to understand what we're ascribing uh, by way of causes of the financial crisis before we use that calculation. So I, I, as a baseline matter, though, cost benefit should be rolled out more broadly in the government. And, you know, Troy, I wish Troy was still here. He could, he explains cost benefit very simply. It, most of the time, it's just explaining your work. This notion that the benefits need to exceed the costs, uh, Craig, as much as I love you, I've read many of your cost benefit analysis that said we can't quantify the benefits and the rule still passed and some have been upheld in, in the D.C. Circuit, unfortunately. So um, I, I think that it, it's just a matter of good government. It's a matter of transparent government, and everybody should want it as a citizen. Fabulous. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Sir Paul uh, Tucker, and uh, thanks all to the audience. Thank you.